Hello and welcome to Sam for Uncut, a podcast for developers about building great products. Today, I'm excited to welcome Woody Zhu. Woody, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thanks for inviting me. I'm looking forward to this. Great. Can you just go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. Well, of course, my name is Woody Zool. I started programming, I think, in 1982. And in 1983, I bought my first computer. I had a need to learn to program because the programs that I wanted to use, the software I wanted to have, either wasn't available or it was terrible. And I thought maybe I should learn how to do this. And it took a while, but within a few months, I was writing useful stuff. I continued programming for myself, for a little company I had until somewhere around 1996 or seven, I started doing work for other people and eventually started working inside other companies. So in the late 90s, 99, really, I started working in companies that are primary functions were either to create software or to create software they use within the company. So that continued on. Agile came along. I really liked the ideas of Agile. I was very much in alignment with how I was already working. And I picked up on those ideas. And then by the end of 2009 or so, I realized I really want to make a difference in how work is done amongst groups that are doing software development. I really enjoyed software development. I didn't enjoy doing it within the realms of working for a company where we were doing software development. It was almost always impossible or really difficult to be effective in our work. So there you go. That kind of covers you know, my career from that point on. I really focused on how let's really make things better. And this is where the time of mob programming came forward for us and a lot of other topics as I was trying to figure out how do we make this much more enjoyable and maybe a lot more effective. Great. I would love us to explore the history and the environment around mob programming, and we are going to do that. But for our listeners who might have heard about mob programming, but you know haven't practiced it or not even heard about it, can you introduce it on the high level? Sure. So the whole idea of mob programming is that we need a lot of people to create software usually. And that doesn't mean that every single skill that we have or need to use needs to be on our team. But we found that the more skills we can gather together to be on a team, things that are pertinent to what we're doing, the better off we are. So with mob programming, we just take it a little bit further that let's all work together at the same screen on the same thing at the same time. And if we do that, then we are really collaborating with each other. Collaboration is a critical thing in modern workplace, but I would say collaboration is a critical thing in why humans are what humans are. As a species, we probably wouldn't even exist if we didn't somewhere along the way figure out how to collaborate. Uh, We do a lot of other things that aren't so good as collaboration, but the value of collaborating is important. So if you can picture, you know, traditionally one person sitting at a computer with maybe their earphones on or they're in a separate room and their heads down, that's sort of how we traditionally think of programming. But with mob programming, there'd be five or six or more of us all sitting at the same computer and talking with each other, deciding what we're going to put into the computer, getting it into the computer. You can think of it as just a slightly expanded idea of pair programming, if you're familiar with that. So there you go. It's just turning up the good on collaboration and recognizing that we need more than one brain. So we perhaps can learn how to better use more than one brain. How can we communicate in real time, getting instant feedback and being able to take baby steps forward very quickly. But I think the ultimate idea is if we can work directly on anything from start to finish, that really means for me, from the beginning of when we have the idea of what we want to do, till when it's in the user's hands and they're actually using it to do the work it's intended to do or play the game it's intended to be. If we can make that direct, the more direct we can make that, the better off we are. And that usually means we need very short feedback loops that will happen from deploying daily or more frequently and all these other things. And on the team, the feedback loop is kept to very minimum when we're all working at the same screen. So that might be a little bit too much of an introduction, but there you go. Picture five or six people all sitting at the same computer. Rather than going off and separately working on the things they need to work on, they bring it all together as a team. So that's the concept. Microservices architecture is all the rage these days. 
But do you know what it really means and how to implement it to empower your teams to make the best decision for the problem at hand? On the Semaphore blog, you can learn about microservices and how to take advantage of features like test reports, monorepo, and Docker support to build, test, and deploy your microservice application at scale. Head over to semaphoreci.com slash blog for more information. And happy reading. I remember maybe it was like 2010 or something like that. There was a company back then. It was called Pivotal or Pivotal Labs. Yeah, yeah. And I think uh, they used pair programming like all day long, <laughs> to put it that way. That's right. Yeah, they even had, I think, like GitHub accounts that were like Josh and Perry or <laughs> something like that. And I remember that it was quite surprising to me that they practice that throughout their work. It's not just, you know, sometimes we do that. So that's also a big thing here, I think, is that with mob programming, that's the way the team works or multiple teams in the company work. And there is a possibility to do some work on your own, right? It's not just a possibility. I'm pretty sure you are going to do some work on your own. So mob programming doesn't replace pair programming or solo programming. It just adds maybe a fuller definition of what it means to work as a whole team. So you could work this way every minute of the day, every day, or you could do it, you know, on time boxes. Some people do it like three days a week, three hours each time. Some folks do it just when they think they need it. There's advantages to doing it all the time. And with our team, where we started doing this, it was all day, every day, but it didn't start as all day, every day. It started as we had a critical project to work on. It was nearing its deadline. I was won't go into this story necessarily. I was going to cancel the project when they hired me. This project was already a year behind or it missed its deadlines. So one of the big signals that I see when I go to help at a company is if they've got work that's late, then we have to question, why are we doing this work at all? Why are we bothering to do work that we're going to be late on? And then once we become late, we really need to scrutinize that. Should have we done this? Maybe we should just cancel it. And that's what I would prefer to do. Anyways, yeah, so this project was starting to be worked on again. And we got together in a room to all look at it together. And instead of looking at it, we started refactoring it using what is now called read by refactoring. But the basic idea was if the code is hard to read or hard to understand, then just start refactoring it. And pretty soon it will become clear and you will learn a lot more about it and you'll never need to do that again. So you, it will always be clear from now on. So anyways, we thought it was for these big projects, but once we started doing it in that very meeting, by the end of that day, we wanted more of it the next day. We actually worked that way for the rest of the day. After the meeting, we kept working that way. The next day we just booked some rooms to go and be together. And then we just set out for the next week. We booked a bunch of rooms across the company so we would have an opportunity to get together. And by the end of two weeks, it was how we were working all day, every day. We found a permanent location where we could push a desk in there and all sit together. So it doesn't replace solo work. I love to program alone. I like to be alone with my brain. If I'm going to have an argument, nobody has to hear it because it's all in my brain. And so I come across as a nicer human when I'm working alone. But you get the picture. And this is the difference between solo, pair, and mob programming. When we're working solo, we get the most direct communication with ourselves. We hear ourselves. We try our ideas. All this happens. As soon as we add other people, we need some kind of a protocol or some kind of a arrangement of work that allows us to communicate well with each other. So it adds a complication that humans have been dealing with since we began by grunting and pointing, probably like our long ago ancestors did. Where does this get us? You know, if we learn to collaborate well, it doesn't matter for mob programming. If we're collaborating well, it's just that mob programming emphasizes the value of that collaboration. And if we learn to do that well, we might want to do it all the time. But there's no rule that says you have to. Most of us, our best thoughts don't come while we're working on the work we're doing anyways. According to some of the research, I'm not much on reading research, but I read explanations of research in books and stuff. And I think a lot of it kind of says 
when we're focused on something, that's an information input period. But we also need this incubation period where we're not focused on it. We're doing other things and our brains work it through in our subconscious. And maybe we're sleeping or maybe we're running or whatever we're doing or taking a shower. And then the idea comes to us. So, yeah, this isn't about working this way all day, every day. It's about having another way of working together. Can we get really good at it? And if we do, what benefit will we get? Exactly. And as you were introducing your very particular situation where you had a project which is late and you are having, in a way, potentially a crisis meeting where you're going to review something, I mean, cross my mind, you know, even during the college times, when there is a tough problem at hand, <laughs> then we tend to, you know, get together, let's sit together in front of the screen. Other example is there is an outage, you know, or some incident that we have, then it's like kind of a number of people on board. <laughs> let's focus, let's work this through together. Yes. So that's really closely related to this. Now, I've been involved in those efforts, you know, working with other people inside companies for 20 plus years. I've seen a lot of examples of that. And what I often see, though, is that they get together, but it's hard on everybody. It's fatiguing. They haven't learned how to work well together. They've only come together in an emergency. And you could think of this in a way, you know, in human existence for eons of time. If an enemy is approaching our village and we haven't been practicing defending our village, we'll, we'll all come together, but we're not going to be so effective with it. Now, I never lived in those times, clearly, but you get the picture here. It's like, Sure, we want to gather together to take care of the emergency. We we'll well practiced on it. So I worked for a bit of time as a board of directors of a fire department. Fire departments are pretty much the same thing all over the world. The idea is we're going to have some people who are really well trained in dealing with an emergency like a fire. So their job isn't to be putting out fires. Their job is really to be prepared to be putting out fires. So Getting prepared at this is kind of part of what this is about. If we work together daily, then we get really good at it. If we only do it when there's an emergency, it's probably not going to be pleasing. And we might celebrate that we're done with it, but then we want to get back and work alone again because that was too much. We have to learn how to work well with each other. And I'm not particularly easy to work with. I'm easily frustrated. You know, I lose patience. I'm there's nothing about me that's special whatsoever. I know people are really good at collaborating with others, and I try to learn from them, but we need to learn to be better. I've tried to become better at working with others since we started doing this. Putting teams together is one of the super important things. It's also hard. As you said, we are all very different. We react differently in different situations and all of that. We have a different histories, different work experiences, and so on. Through my career, which is much shorter than yours, I have seen people that work great together, just a pure chance of luck, how they, you know, matched. But there are also situations where you have kind of the people in the same team that, as you said, need to learn to work together. It's not like um, <laughs> asking for advice in this area. It's kind of like it depends. There are like so many factors. But how do you usually introduce people to these ideas? And what are some obstacles usually that you see and patterns in introducing it? That's a good thing to cover because if we understand that collaboration is important and we understand we're not particularly good at it, then that's a good starting spot. Now, some people are naturally good at working with others. I remember as a kid in school, there were some kids that were really good at getting everyone together so we can play a game or whatever. And there's others who are going to naturally be alone or some that are going to disrupt the game. So, you know, we have all those different things in our adult life as well. I would say that the most important thing is we should never force somebody to work this way, that this would be a choice somebody would make. I think a lot of people who say they need to think alone just means they never even learned or considered how to learn how to think with other people. But I also think they're incorrect. So when we say we need to think alone, we don't mean without any collaboration most of the time. Otherwise, all of our code would have to have been written by us because just using somebody else's 
library implies a type of collaboration, very limited one way, maybe same thing with reading books or watching videos that show how to do something. So we are collaborating whether we think we are or not. If we're working in a company where there's more than one person and we have a customer, then we're collaborating in some form or another. Somebody has to get the software we've written and put it on their computer or use it on the web. We're really talking about collaboration at the very least capable level of collaboration possible. So people, I think, often don't realize how much collaboration they're doing. They'll send an email. That's a type of collaboration. They'll send a message. They'll leave a message. They'll talk to someone on the phone. They'll go to meetings. These are all forms of collaboration. So you can think of it at the very least level. It's some kind of a communication where it's one way only. As we grow the idea of collaboration, it's going to include round trips of feedback. Matter of fact, the difficulty with collaboration and communication isn't that we can't do them. It's that we often think we're doing them, but we're not doing them very well. So particularly with communication, we think we're expressing the idea we're trying to express and nobody else is getting it. I'm sure that happens to me all the time. It all comes down to, are the people willing to try to learn to do this? I happen to be with a team that when we kind of stumbled upon this idea that was really open to learning how to better collaborate because it was one of the problems they were having there. I was hired to manage a team and this team had six or seven people on it A few team members weren't actually on the team, but they were people we worked with closely as well. They just weren't collaborating. They weren't collaborating at all. When I was interviewed, I went and looked at how they were working and their work situation and how often they communicated. So what I was offering to them was, let's learn to work in a more agile manner, which includes working as a team. It doesn't mean programming at the same computer, except for with pair programming. But if you get the picture here, if you're not collaborating at all, or very little, you can learn to collaborate more and more. In this situation, they were willing to do that. And if they weren't willing to do that, I probably wouldn't have taken the job. I probably wouldn't have taken the job if the team was resistant to the idea of learning how to work better together. Microservices architecture is all their age these days. But do you know what it really means and how to implement it to empower your teams to make the best decision for the problem at hand? On the Semaphore blog, you can learn about microservices and how to take advantage of features like test reports, monorepo, and Docker support to build, test, and deploy your microservice application at scale. Head over to semaphoreci.com blog for more information. And happy reading. I remember one of the elements back then when we discovered or learned about pair programming. Back then we were doing, you know, a client work for a couple of smaller companies, but it was, let's say, five to ten of us working. And one of the thoughts that we have, okay, will we have to justify now that two people are not working separately, you know, but now they're working together. So why would you need to justify that? And to who would you need to justify that? Yeah, we were under the impression as we were, you know, kind of working on the project and there are like tickets that have been distributed and now we are kind of not working in parallel or concurrently to say, but, you know, more sequentially. And in the end, we exactly, as you said, no need to justify that. The main thing is the output that we produce and the quality of the solutions that were created. And I remember that, you know, pair program impacted quality quite a bit because I remember myself working on something. Okay. I don't know if I have energy now to go into that code and, you know, make it nicer, you know, let's kind of sweep it under the rug, but there is that element working with someone together. I always felt that quality gets better. I believe part of the reason that happens is because we're a little bit less willing to let those things slide when someone else is there with us to take it a big step forward from that is that we now have somebody who can agree, yeah, we should make this bit better. So whereas before, I'd love to, but I don't have the time to right now because we feel under the pressure. And now we have someone saying, yeah, let's do it now because we want tomorrow to be as easy as today is. If we keep, like you say, sweeping it under the rug, eventually the rug isn't laying flat anymore. It's a big lump 
And when you walk in the room, you're going to trip over the rug. That's what's happening in our code. It is not uncommon. And I have seen it myself many, many times that after two months or three months, progress drops. And pretty soon we can't hardly deliver at all because we've allowed our code to become too difficult to work on. So having a pair certainly allows us to be more engaged and more focused on keeping things as enhanceable, as maintainable as possible. That means we're going to make tomorrow as easy as today is. So taking that thinking that I introduced maybe a step further. So now we have a team of four or five, six people working together on something. It's not that I am some uh, <laughs> productivity freak to say, and you know, what's the kind of the return on investment on five people working on the same thing together opposed to five people working separately? Can we rephrase that slightly? The difference between five people working on the same thing together or five people working on the same thing separately, because that's really what we're doing. So a lot of people will say, and this is, you know, in, in my talks I give, I will ask, you know, or people will say, how can you be productive with five people at one computer? And when I talk to those people and I say, well, what is it you think how things work? They will say, well, I want to have five things being worked on. I want to get five things done, not one thing done. Well, if we're all working on the same thing, we're going to get that thing done. If we're all working on the same thing separately, because we're not really working on separate things. If we were, we have some really brilliant software, right? We're all working on different parts of the same thing. Is there a benefit to that? People will actually ask me, they'll say, where's the research that shows working as a group is better than separating the work and having it work separately? I'll say, well, how do you work? We work separately. So where's the research that shows you that working separately is better than working as a group? It would be the same research, and yet you've already bought into the idea that working separately is better than working as a group. Why do you need research to think that maybe it's the other way around? We're not willing to think about these things. We want someone to prove to us that what we're doing needs to be changed before we're willing to think about changing it. And I take the very opposite point of view which is I know that whatever we're doing today can be improved. Whatever we're doing today can be improved. So don't say there's no improvement out there. Now, you want to prove to yourself that working together as a team is better? Well, go get a heart surgery and then look around the room and see, do they have one person working on you and the rest of them are off doing something else? Or is there six or seven people there making sure your operation is successful? There's lots of times, like if you're having a wedding, would you hire a band of just a bass player to play for the dance? You want the whole band to play for the dance. You know, this is the thing. We think that it's less productive or somehow less good to have a team, but so many things we do in human existence are because a team makes it better. There's almost no work that I've done in my life where there weren't team aspects outside of software development as well. And why this exists today, why mob programming exists probably for me is that when I start working in software development for other people, I got on a company, went to a company where they had teams. Everybody was on a team and there were about 200 software developers, all freshly hired to work on this project. And everybody was put on a team. The teams basically are focusing on certain aspects of each feature. So this team is going to do the front end of this feature. Some other team is doing the back end of this feature. Some team is doing the database of this feature. But then we all have our own different features we're working on. But none of the work was done as a team. So I'm sitting in the same area with all the people that I'm working with. And we do no work as a team. We split the work up. And this was 20 plus years ago. There wasn't any such thing as agile at that time. We split the work up and everybody worked individually on it. And I kept thinking to myself, why do they call this a team? You know, what is team like about this? Nothing. There was no teamwork. So this is interesting to me. If I've had a lot of experience in work where we worked as a team, why do we refuse to do it when we're working in software development? I actually think this is a troubling aspect of it, that people have already confirmed for themselves that software development is about working alone. One thing is, my computer I'm using right now to talk with you, it has a built-in keyboard, right? So it's kind of saying, this screen is for you, this keyboard is for you, you're working alone. It almost tells us that that's what it is. We have to rearrange our thinking a little bit because our tools kind of force us into thinking that this is a solo activity. I wanted to introduce that specifically so we can, you know, 
talk and discover what could be the benefits. As this has been the year for us when we have been expanding our team more drastically, you know, faster than previously, and the whole work on onboarding a person to a project that has been worked on for 10 years in a different domain is a huge thing, which is to some extent, of course, stressful for the person that is joining, you know, there are many things that had to be learned. So I'm just putting that out as one of the benefits, you know, as person is joining. Yes. It almost eliminates the onboarding aspect that most people suffer through. I've worked with companies or I've done workshops and stuff at companies where they would bring in a bunch of interns. And, and instead of taking advantage of these fresh brains, they put them on grunt work. So they get used to the environment. They learn how to you know, work in an environment that deadens our brains instead of enlivens them. And so this is what they do to people. With mob programming, when you join a team, you can be effective from the very first moment. And you're learning by working in the real code from the very first moment, instead of going through example trainings. I've been through trainings. I was at one place where we went through two months of training before we were allowed to work in the live code to maintain. And it turned out the training was so outdated that it didn't relate to the current code anyways, because who wants to rewrite two months worth of training? And so this is the thing, mob programming, when you sit down with a team who's already well-versed in the software we're working with, but they need your skills. You know, Your skills need to be added to the team you're going to move along much quicker, becoming, you know, adjusted, acclimated, and then contributing. And I've seen it happen within 10 minutes of someone joining a team. They're giving value. They don't need to know the business logic. They don't need to know where the files are. They don't need to know how to build the project. All the things they can learn over time, over the next few weeks, but they can contribute their technical knowledge or their ability to design or their understanding of the technical stuff we're trying to do. But it doesn't even have to be technical stuff. Mob programming is more inclusive than just the code writers. It could be the testers. I prefer to see it with a tester, a product owner, part of the team. They're actually working together at the same keyboard, at the same screen, so to speak. And of course, it can be done remotely. But I'd like to address this as well. What are the benefits? If the benefits were merely that we enjoy our work more, that would be enough of a reason. As long as we're not degrading our ability to produce the work we're producing. But the four big things we noticed were, first of all, we were getting a lot more done. Now, I saw that also with pair programming. A lot more will get done than the two could do separately. But it's of higher quality, as you've noticed already. Another big thing, though, that we noticed was there's a lot of knowledge sharing. So we're growing the ability of the team to better understand the environment they're in. How does my work affect you? How does your work affect me? We now become, instead of having this silo concept of we have a silo of knowledge, with every silo of knowledge comes a silo of ignorance. And we're removing the both of those. We're now sharing some of our knowledge across the team and we're losing our own ignorance on the team. So the last thing we would notice is lots of learning, but also it's very engaging and fun. We can stay focused because we're making really good progress. If there's something that's blocking a single member of the team when we're working separately, that thing can block them for a few hours or a few days, maybe for a few weeks. And the rest of the team doesn't really care because it's not affecting them. When we put everybody together, it becomes real clear how important those blocks are, and we then remove them. And now we can focus on this. So more engaging, got more done, higher quality, and knowledge sharing. It all builds. This grows. This is powerful stuff. As you went through this list of couple of things, I'm not sure what more can anyone ask. <laughs> I meant like what more can someone ask in terms of like to add to the team? Because as you went through those things, those are the crucial and essential points of like working together in the team. So that's right. So I'd like to throw this in then. If you're really interested in improving the ability of your people to be effective in their work, and we ignore things like this, then we might be losing out on something that is going to become important to everyone. So I say we should be always leapfrogging. So when I first started doing pair programming, I had worked solo. And the moment I heard, I would say literally the moment somebody told me about pair programming, I said, I'd like to try that. Now, I had no idea whether it would help or not, but that they were saying, there's people doing this, 
it clicked in my head, I better know about this. Now, it took me almost five years to become good at it. I became okay at it, but it took me a long time to get good at it. And it was hard to find places you could work where they were allowing you to do pair program. But you get the picture here. I'm not saying mob programming really answers anything. We didn't set out to solve any problems. We set out to turn up the good on us collaborating. What it would look like, we didn't know. I just knew that the better we are at working with each other, the better chance we have of having a great day, successful work, meaningful things to do. So yeah, I would say, I don't know if mob programming is going to be around forever, but it's certainly growing quite a bit. But I would say, if we ignore this, then we'll probably ignore the next really good thing that comes along and the next really good thing that comes along. So we got to be paying attention. A lot of what we do today across our industry wasn't even thought of 20 years ago. And a lot of it wasn't even thought of 10 years ago. There was hardly anybody talking, you know, let's say 20 years ago about deploying every 10 minutes or deploying at the end of each little thing that we've done. And now there's companies that do that automatically all the time. Yeah, things change. Are we willing to realize that even if we don't think something's good, it might be a lot better than we think? Yeah, I agree. I agree. As we were talking about this, I was thinking about when I started working in my first job. And there is that element of you just enter an environment. You don't know the people. <laughs> you know tools to some extent. You know the programming language to some extent. You know the domain. Maybe you don't know anything about them. There are just so many things, you know, that you have to tackle. It takes many, many, many months. And you have to go around and pull people. Can you help me with this? Can you help me with that? Can I ask this and that? So I want to ask specifically if you have experiences with introducing people who are just starting their career into a team, which is practicing more programming. Actually, what I'm asking, there are people of very different level of experiences. It can be experience, you know, one month experience and other colleague can have like 10 plus years of experience. Can you comment on that? How that works together? What have you seen? I'm just curious. So first of all, there's such a thing as beginner's mind that some people believe is very important. And I agree. So if we can maintain a beginner's mind throughout our career, that's a big part of what we've been talking about. But to take a true beginner and add them to the team now adds a perspective that we won't be able to get any other way onto the team. So I like to have a more junior person on a team. I like to think of this as the old extreme programming concept of whole team that Kent Beck wrote about in Extreme Programming Explained. I always have a copy of his book, by the way, nearby. You've probably interviewed him. Brilliant, Kent Beck. But literally, I look at this book every few days. I usually keep it on the bookshelf back here. I got it out yesterday to look up something literally, literally about a whole team. Here's the thing. A team of people who think the same is not exactly what we want. What we want is a shared understanding of the problems we're trying to solve, and that takes time. We can't define that up front. Most of the stuff we work on, we don't learn what it is until we start working on it. So it's in the doing of the work that we discover the work we must do. If we can get five different perspectives on that work, we're going to be a lot better than if we just have the one perspective. Two perspectives is okay. Three is where we really start getting the value. And I want that beginner's mind. So the workshops I do, I do workshops on mob programming, sometimes with really young people. I did some once with a group that was, let's say, 10-year-olds. They were just learning to program. And the problem I put in front of them that we were going to work on, I had already solved many times myself and seen other teams in training solve. They approached it from a non-programmer point of view and came up with the most elegant solution that I have yet seen. This is an exercise I've now been doing for almost 10 years. They came up with a very elegant solution that most programmers jumped to a gnarly programmer style solution that uses a lot of technical thinking. Most of our work isn't really about technical thinking. We're solving human level problems. Our brains work best when we're working on human level problems. The languages we work in in software development are extremely limited and we invent parts of those languages ourselves, you know, because everything we write is a kind of a domain-specific language. I want those beginners. I like to say, let's release the inner fourth grader in each one of us because we want their ability to think that we've lost 
by the time we become programmers, we want to get as close to that as we can. Everybody should hire a couple fourth graders to put on their team. Let's look at this from other points of view. Not everybody on the team is going to be as expert as they need to be. Often in the hiring process across our industry, we fail to hire well because we really don't know how to do it or most companies don't know how to do it. We fail to prepare people well and so on. So yeah, this is something we need to do. So one of the techniques we would use is if we have a more junior person and a more senior person, we're all looking at this together and the more junior person expresses an idea and the more senior person expresses an idea, we'll try both ideas. And we'll focus on trying the more junior person's idea first because that's where the learning will come from. Because often what happens if we use an idea like an old person like me, you know, uses the same idea over and over, that's one of the patterns that we're stuck in. And that's not helpful. If I can expand my own thinking by having a different point of view interjected. Now, usually I like to see it with four or five different skills on the team at least. I like to see a whole team so we can go start to finish without having to go off the team to get an answer to anything. And that means there's got to be a lot of knowledge there, including the product owner, including the testers. What I like to see is that the people whose specialty we're dealing with at a particular moment, they're going to be interjecting most of the important stuff, but everybody else will have stuff to interject. We start realizing that if we're doing a database thing, the database person is sort of directing us at the moment, there's going to be good ideas floating up from others. And in reverse, we're working on some front end thing. The database person might say, wait a second, you're hard coding some stuff that should go into a data store somewhere. That should be in a config file or maybe actually in the database. So we get the, all those different viewpoints and we resolve problems that therefore never happen for us. There's a great paper on that. Nobody ever gets credit for solving problems that never happen. If we can make it where the problems never happen, that's what we should be rewarding. And it's really hard to do that. But that thinking is what we want. We want everyone there at the moment it's important. And that really means we have to be together logically all the time. We may not be able to, but maybe it'll be better if we do. I think this will be a um, very good episode for a lot of people because I know that actually majority of teams have never even tried, you know, pair programming, let alone mob programming. But I can just confirm what you were saying. A lot of these things are powerful. Discovering how we can, you know, collaborate, work together, understand each other, become better and collaborating on a various levels, not just by working on a particular problem at hand. So yeah, thank you for all this. Thank you for sharing. And yeah, for our listeners, we are going to include a couple of links where you can find more about Woody and his work and some of the great talks that he did in the past. Thank you so much. Thank you.